I'm Philip. I'm a solution architect uh, with Agira. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, I also have with me uh, Jane. She's my colleague. She's based in the UK and she handles the commercial part for EMEA. So at any time, if you want more information or are interested in what you're going to see, please reach out to Jane or myself. I will try to get back to you uh, as quickly as we can. Um, we're a pretty small group. Um, so please do not hesitate to, um, to get back to us over chat or email. So um, that's a picture of me, nothing fancy. <laughs> Um, so what are we going to cover today? Um, well, I uh, will do a small overview about AKS and the networking options, which are uh, of particular interest for, for Calico, of course, and that will be the main topic of uh, today. Um, we'll take a look at Calico open source, Calico Enterprise Edition, and how it is deployed on top of uh, Azure AKS, so that's the Azure Kubernetes service. Um, we'll end with a small demo and some questions if you're interested. Everything we'll see and do, you can fairly easily repeat it. Um, we shared the link over here. Um, so it basically explains how you can reproduce uh, these labs. So what is Project Calico? Uh, Calico is a pretty known name. It's actually a community that is maintaining and developing Calico, which is an open source networking plugin for Kubernetes and containers, but also for virtual machines, as well as host-based workloads. So mainly um, Calico is focused on the networking part, of course, as well as a security part, well known as network security policies. So why Calico? Why would we actually try to use Calico inside of AKS? Well, uh, the main advantages of Calico is that it's pretty simple from an architecture point of view and it's immensely scalable. So Calico is typically used when speed and performance is important. It's massively scalable. It's one of the only CNIs that can actually scale up to the limits of Kubernetes, which is pretty important. Um, it's known and used all over the place. All major managed cloud uh, environments have an option to use Calico network policies. Today we'll focus on Azure AKS, but you can do it on AWS, Google, and EBM if uh, interested. We'll have a session later on in the month uh, where we'll do more or less the same on AWS. It's also integrated in most of the, let's say, uh, package solution like Docker Enterprise or Rancher or uh, can be used with OpenShift. Calico is used pretty wide. Uh, we know of more than 150,000 clusters and one, more than 1 million of nodes currently using Calico. So um, it's a well-proven known technology and that should uh, strengthen the feeling that it is a good choice and a decent choice for your production and Kubernetes environments. Also used by one of the largest companies in the world. Uh, a few names, but there are of course more. Now, uh, as I said, um, Calico is used in an industry, is industry wide and an industry standard. Um, so it can be used as I already mentioned in most of the managed public clouds as well as on premise. And why I'm repeating myself is simply um, is that once 
you would opt to use Calico or Calico Enterprise, no matter where your apps live, where you're moving from one cloud to another, well, you can take actually your security along with you. Policies written in Calico can be used as well in AWS as you would move to AKS, for example. Um, another cool advantage is that it's portable is that Calico Enterprise has the ability to uh, use federated security or to implement federated security. That means that using your policies, you can actually decide where to deploy them, whether your apps are living in a mixed environment. Well, the same policies, same strategy can be used to uh, deploy your policies straight into the right cloud all from one uh, console. So um, let's focus on AKS for a second um, and Azure um, in, the, in that matter. So AKS is the Azure Kubernetes Service. It's a managed Kubernetes solution offered by Azure. And it's pretty widely used here in Europe. Um, so let's take a look at the options that we have available. Uh, so when we check out AKS, we'll see that we have quite a few uh, options uh, when we want to deploy an AKS cluster. The default AKS way to deploy, to deploy a cluster is what is known as KubeNet. KubeNet is a CNI, so a container network interface plugin used by Kubernetes. Uh, that's making sure that your pod IP addresses, your pods get IP addresses and can connect to each other. So the default one, or what's often referred to as the basic Kubernetes, uh, sorry, the basic yeah, uh, networking plugin is KubeNet. KubeNet is very, very, very simple. Um, it's pretty easy to use because it's by default, but it lacks uh, quite some functionality that you can find in Calico or in the Azure CNI. Now the good news is that we can combine KubeNet, which has no security built in, uh, with Calico and actually use the Calico networking policy options inside of AKS. The real truth is if you use KubeNet plus Calico, you're actually using Calico as the CNI as well as for network policies. The difference is that this is a managed Calico install, so you cannot go in and change or upgrade Calico if you would like to do that. If this is the option, we need to resort to another um, way of doing that. Just know that if we use KubeNet and we select the option Calico network plug as Calico network policies, that we'll be using Calico. Now. As I mentioned, KubeNet is a very simple one. Um, that's probably the reason why there is a more advanced CNI that popped up in AKS uh, later on, which is referred to as Azure CNI. And the Azure CNI looks a bit uh, from a networking perspective to what Calico is doing. Uh, also offers network policies and that's where the main difference is. Um, the network policies offered in uh, Azure CNI are less um, feature rich. So again, we can use Azure CNI together with Calico network policies, if we would like to do that, to actually have a full featured um, way of doing network security. If none of these needs uh, or none of these things meet your needs, you can also resort into uh, installing actually Calico Pure Play on Linux host together with Windows, um, even if you like, and manage the entire environment yourself. So let's take a small look at what KubeNet is doing so that we can actually understand what and how the networking works and what are the pros and cons of that networking. So if you install actually an AKS cluster together, um, like 
in the basic setup with just uh, networking. This is how it actually works. So what AKS will do for you is it will create a bunch of nodes. It's a managed environment. So that would essentially means that the Kubernetes controllers or the Kubernetes masters are actually handled by Azure. And depending on how you set it up and what your specifications are, they will create a few nodes for you. Um, referred here as node one and node two. Um, node one and node two are Linux machines um, that are actually uh, connected to a virtual network, a VNet in Azure. VNets can be assigned automatically or if you would uh, prefer, you can actually manually define which VNets uh, to use if you want to route outside um, that VNet, of course. So as you see, the IP addresses of the Azure networking are in the range by default 10 to uh, 40 slash 16. Um, KubeNet, which is a CNI, so a container networking interface, basically uses another range, which is referred to as the pod side. In this case, this is 10 to 44 slash 16. Um, that's the pod side. As you can see uh, on the slides, every node has a subset of that pod side, so slash 24. In this case, node one has 10 to 440, node two has 10 to 44.1. These are actually ranges that are assigned to each node. That's why we refer it to host local IPAM. Host local IPAM means that every node is responsible of managing every IP address it actually allocates and removes. So there is no something like IPAM or Calico IPAM or something else that manages the IP addresses inside of the cluster. This is taken care of. Uh, by each node itself. The range is assigned to a node upon node creation. So there is no intelligent mechanism in this case to manage the IP address. It's clean and simple. So there is no real way to change this afterwards needed. Once the pods are brought up, um, they of course get an IP address outside of the pod side block or range that is assigned to the node and they can start communicating. Now, the pod side network, so 10244 in this case, um, is something totally, that something that lives totally inside of Kubernetes and the nodes. So there is no external reachability uh, to these pod IP addresses. In contrast, typically when you have Calico CNI, your pods might have routable IP addresses. So how does KubeNet solve this? Well, KubeNet uh, uses an approach using vet pairs. So for every pod that has an Ethernet interface, a vet pair is created. Um, don't break your head on the naming of the vet pairs because it's an algorithm behind it to map it. Um, so all these vet interfaces, you can see them actually, if you could log into the node, uh, you can actually see these IP addresses on the system. And they are actually linked to a bridge, which is a big difference with Calico CNI, where everything is routed and not using bridges. But KubeNet is using the mechanism as you might have seen in the past in a pure Docker node, where every vet pair or every pod is actually connected to the bridge network. And communication between pod A and pod B, uh, in this case, uh, is happening over the bridge network and not uh, routed over the virtual router function of the kernel, which makes it pretty easy from a routing perspective um, because the only thing the host kernel routing needs to know is what range, so in this case, 10244, uh, to route to the bridge, or if it is not uh, destined to the bridge network, uh, send it out over ETH0 on the default network. So pretty simple. Now, um, as I already mentioned, 
the ranges assigned to every node for pod networking are not routable. Um, it's one thing. And second of all, we need to make sure that node one can actually reach node two. So that also means that we need to enable IP forwarding on the interfaces. If you create an AKS cluster automatically, this is done for you. But of course, if you want to play around, you have to take into account that you have to enable IP forwarding. Now, even with IP forwarding enabled, there is no magic that this cluster is learning between each other who owns which IP addresses. That also means that on the Azure networking side, uh, there need to be routing set up. This is referred to as user-defined routes, which basically means that every node or in the VNet subnet, there are routes that are actually saying which ranges are reachable on which nodes in the AKS cluster. That's all cool, but that also means if you want your Kubernetes cluster to connect to, let's say, a simple VM, yeah, that you have to take into account all this routing information to make sure um, it will continue to work. That's also the reason why um, KubeNet applies address translation. So it is not actually sending out 10.24.0.2, for example, up to the networking layer. There is an option or not an option, it's uh, they, they choose a solution so that everything that is leaving actually the nodes is address translated. Uh, so it's actually seen as the IP address of the node uh, when it leaves the, uh, the node. So if you know Calico CNI, this is pretty simple uh, from a networking perspective. Now, KubeNet itself, so if you use basic KubeNet with host local IPAM, there is no support for network policies, not even Kubernetes uh, native network policies. So once you select the option to use Calico policies inside of uh, AKS, at that point, um, some changes need to be done. This is referred to as managed Calico um, solution that essentially means that if you select Calico, um, networking is slightly different, although I must say it's hidden behind the managed uh, idea of Kubernetes. So once you enable network policies by Calico in KubeNet, which is the only solution, by the way, um, everything is routed. Um, and Calico is taking care of the routing inside of um, nodes. Once outside, exactly the same problem, you still have address translation and so on and so forth. But using this routing approach, um, Calico is capable to insert firewall rules referred to as network policies by Calico. So if you want security, network policies inside KubeNet. The only option today is to use uh, Calico for that, which is actually a small tick in the box and can fairly easily be uh, configured. Um, I don't know, let me go back quickly. So if you want to actually install KubeNet plus Calico or you select it in the UI, or you actually specify network plugin KubeNet with network policy Calico. Yeah. Simple as that. Now, if you want to see how everything is routed, well, you can. So this is what is explained here. Now, once we go to a more advanced uh, network solution, uh, we can actually use the Azure CNI and the Azure CNI is slightly different in that point that Azure CNI removes the need to do address translation. That means that your 
pods will get an IP address um, assigned out of the VNet on which your AKS cluster is deployed. As you can see, your pods do have IP addresses in the same network as your nodes. That means that your pods are reachable from the outside and that, of course, you need to make sure that the routing um, is taken care of by AKS. Again, Azure CNI has an option to use Azure network policies. Uh, I checked it out. It's actually native Kubernetes uh, network policies. So that's one option. And to be fairly honest, Calico is not in the play at this moment. Um, but as we already explained in other sessions, we know that Calico uh, can offer more advanced functionality when it comes down to network policies and security. So of course there is a way to use Calico uh, policies with Azure um, IBAM. So at this moment, we're talking about Azure CNI together with Azure IPAM. Azure IPAM refers to the fact how Azure is assigning IP addresses. Actually, these are pod IP addresses are secondary IP addresses on the interface, um, which is totally not how Calico is doing, but you can uh, opt for the Calico policy functionality so that you can use all superb uh, functionality of that part. So in this case, there is no address translation uh, going on, um, which can help from one that thing, routing perspective and performance perspective if, if necessary. This is not AKS. So if you want fully flavored Calico or Calico Enterprise solution, well, you can always install your own Linux nodes. You can take care of the routing and you can actually install Calico on top of Linux. And then you can actually use Calico as you would use it on any other uh, scenario. So this was a very brief um, overview of networking. Um, when you Google around, you will find some more information uh, around it. But just keep in mind that if you need to use KubeNet uh, for one reason or the other, because it's way more efficient from an IP uh, management uh, perspective. Um, you have the option to use uh, Calico network policies. If you can go to Azure CNI, well, you can also do it. So from a networking perspective, security perspective, it stays the same, but there are some considerations to make, of course, when it comes down to the networking. So, the considerations uh, in short is think about how IPAM allocates uh, the IP addresses. By default, it's in slash 24 IP range. If you know the details about Calico, Calico can use this, but it's fully configurable. And we have the idea of blocks, IP blocks to further optimize the routing. Yeah. KubeNet are non-routable. IP addresses, and there is no option to make it routable. Yeah? While Azure CNI is a routed solution, while if you think about Calico, it offers uh, a full combination and even a mix. Yeah? Before you actually build your clusters, take into account the size of the VNets, because it should anticipate the number of pod IP addresses that you are using. Um, and of course, you need to take in mind that if clusters grow, you might run into IP exhaustion um, because of the simple reason that your VNet is defined. So everything should fit in that VNet. And these are things you cannot change after uh, the fact. So think about that. Um, these are things that Calico uh, when we talk about Calico IPAM, yeah, it takes care of if that's a problem. So as I mentioned, uh, for Calico, 
networking and Calico network policies. So the combination KubeNet plus Calico uh, is using, using Calico C9. Um, but this is referred to as managed Calico uh, install. That means that Calico is installed and managed by Azure AKS when it is installed. It's, you don't have to do anything uh, for that. So that's something to take in mind. When we talk about unmanaged, it basically means that um, we can install Calico ourselves. I'll discuss that in the next. So when you use network policy Calico yeah, in the configuration and installation, it is actually doing the managed option. So it's probably not the latest release of Calico. Um, AKS and Azure are aware of this problem. Well, problem, it's not really a problem, uh, but uh, this limitation that customers want to manage themselves Calico. So they introduced pretty lately uh, an option where the network plugin is Azure, Azure CNI and an option to use transparent networking. If you use a transparent networking mode uh, in AKS, you can actually manage the entire Calico um, yourself. You can upgrade it, you can install it from scratch and so on and so forth. But it actually is a way to say, okay, don't use Azure CNI or KubeNet, just uh, make sure everything gets routed and then Calico can do its thing. Now, there are a few links here in the presentation. We will share a presentation, so you can take a look at that. Um, it's pretty hard to find, honestly, but there is a cool block about transparent. But it actually is a way to configure AKS, not to use any bridges. Um, before I forget, there are a few other upcoming events. Uh, so the list can be shared. Uh, we will be doing something on Kubernetes security in EMEA pretty soon. Uh, and we will do a similar uh, workshop um, about EKS, so on AWS um, later in September. What we will show right now in the demo is first of all, how, and you can actually start playing around or testing around with uh, Calico. Um, as you know, Calico is open source, but it's also Calico Enterprise Edition um, for sure. So Calico Enterprise Edition can be installed on top of AKS. I have a system running. So if the demo gods are with me, I will show that. Calico Enterprise adds quite some interesting features uh, like policy auto creation. Uh, one of the feedbacks we typically get is creating network policies can be a daunting task and can be, can be error prone if you just use YAML files. Well, Calico Enterprise can do and build auto creation of policies, which is pretty cool. Um, also have an option to actually preview and stage policies. That means that if you make a policy change, you can actually see what would, let's say, theoretically happen before you actually enforce the policy uh, into production. It also includes quite a lot of troubleshooting tools like a policy visualization and last but not least, certainly in-depth detailed logging. Uh, about which flows are actually happening in between your pods as well as in between your pods and the external um, world. Also, it includes compliance reporting and so on and so forth so that you can actually see what changed from a security perspective. Did we actually see new endpoints and so on and so forth. So all these our features, uh, and the list is way longer, um, of course, than what I could uh, match on the slide. But feel free to uh, sign up for an enterprise uh, uh, trial. Um, something went wrong, but it's actually tagira.io slash trial. So you can sign up 
and start playing around with some examples um, on the enterprise edition of Calico. Don't know if there are any questions at this moment. Okay, and then I will uh, stop the presentation and I will actually go quickly to this wonderful um, document my colleague Ivan wrote. Uh, I can share the link, I will put it in the chat. Uh, if I can find it. I cannot find it in the chat. So it should be in the chat. So it actually documents uh, very neatly all the options and how to actually go and configure all this. Now, I used this document to actually prepare for my demos. So it actually explains you how to install KubeNet, KubeNet with Calico, Azure CNI, which is not related, uh, sorry, Azure CNI with Calico um, and so on and so forth. Um, and below we actually work on um, how to set all this up. So feel free to take a look at this document um, and I'll take my console here and try to move it to uh, here. So um, as every good cooking program, I uh, already prepared uh, one setup of AKS because I'm running in some resource issues uh, with the amount of VMs and resources I'm using. But at the end of the day, um, I'll repeat the steps, and if it fails, it's simply because uh, I don't have any resources left. So, um, as you can see, uh, I'm using the Azure CLI here uh, to actually uh, see whether my AKS cluster is up and running. So, there are two ways to essentially use or install uh, AKS, and one of these ways is through the Azure AKS install command. Yeah. And a more advanced way or a more repeatable way through means of ARM templates, which is essentially Azure resource management templates. I tried both uh, solutions. Um, you can use um, the AZ AKS install command to install Calico, um, as we discussed. If you want to install uh, the Tagira or the Calico Enterprise Edition, uh, we advise to use um, the template solution, although you can do it with the AKS install. So to go on with this, um, I created a separate folder. And so there are a few things you have to do. It's not as simple as typing AZ AKS install. So um, if you really want to do it from scratch, my PC is hanging. If you really want to do it from scratch, um, there are a few things to do it. So first of all, what you need to do is have the Azure CLI installed. Um, this is the link, but if you search for Azure CLI, you can actually install it. There is an installer for Windows, Mac, and Linux. I just used it on Ubuntu when I used apt-get update and so on and so forth, and it worked out fine. So first things first, we need to get the AZ uh, This here is at least working, it gives an error message, but it's working. Yeah. So once you have AZ installed, the next step. Hello. Yeah. We have a request to increase the font size on that screen, and it is ah, actually yeah, pretty tiny. 
No, no worries. Uh, for me, it looks big, so. <laughs> yeah, okay. Anyone over 10 cannot read that. Thank you. Oh, oops. No, um, is it better? Okay. So, um, first of all, make sure we get uh, a set installed, which is pretty uh, easy to do. Next thing, uh, let me clear up the screen a little bit. The next thing to do actually is log in to Azure. Um, once you're logged in, it's fine. Um, you don't have to repeat every time, but by using AZ login, uh, you get actually prompted to go to a website so that you can actually authorize. Um, no, that was the one. Yeah, also so you can actually log in. It asks you for the code, which is displayed in this uh, message. And once you actually provide that code, we'll authorize after you authenticate, of course, um, this AZ CLI to actually uh, use uh, the APIs of Microsoft, okay? So this is something you only have to do once. I'm just uh, going through the procedure. Uh, this is not something related to AKS. This is something uh, you always have to do. Now, um, before you can actually use all the features of AKS, we need to prepare um, the Azure CLI to do a few things. Um, so again, this is something you don't have, you have to do it to use actually uh, AKS, but it's not something related to Calico, just a way to, um, to get it installed or use the AZ. So there is actually uh, a possibility to use Azure extensions so this is the command to actually list all the Azure extensions. So you can see there are a lot of things you can add or at least tell Azure to um, use these uh, extensions. So they're not there by default. Um, one of these extensions is for example, to use uh, preview uh, versions of the product. For example, if you would check Kubernetes, I think it only supports version 16 uh 169 um, if you want to use 17 or the 18 uh, branch you actually are in preview mode so to do that you can actually uh, add or update extensions uh, so the command to actually add extensions for aks preview you can actually add but probably it's also it already says that it's installed because i already uh, played around with it so after we have AZ logged in, we need to tell AZ that it can use the preview versions of AKS. And then we also have to explain um, that we need to use some specific uh, Microsoft container service features. Um, if you remember, as I said, to actually use Calico together with Azure CNI, we need that network mode um, enabled. So we also need to tell the Azure CLI um, that you can actually use that functionality. And as the error message or not the error message says that you also have to propagate it. And we also need to make sure that it is registered. At this point, um, we only prepared the Azure CLI to make sure that it can actually install the AKS. If you want to see which features are installed, well, you can um, by using this command. So we know that this, these are a few requirements before we can actually go on and use um, the AZ CLI. Now, right now we can actually authenticate, we can connect to the Azure API. Uh, and at this point, 
we are in a scenario where we could actually tell AKS to spin up an AKS cluster. Now, if life would be that simple, uh, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you also know that if Kubernetes spins up and you create a service, that it can connect to the cloud to basically set up uh, load balances or to change something at the network layer of AKS. So to make sure our AKS cluster is capable to actually talk uh, to Azure to actually install or configure the load balancer, we also need to make sure that our AKS or Kubernetes cluster in this case is capable of authenticating to Azure. So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. So to do this, we need to create what is called a service principle. A service principle, if you Google it, basically means that you can um, connect to um, the Azure API, authenticate, so that you can actually make modifications. So to do that, we can actually use some help variables. So my service principle is called Philip Laser Tool. And using this incredibly difficult command, as you can see, I can actually create in Active Directory a service principle called Philip Laser. Um, you have to wait about 10, 15 seconds before it's actually propagated, but to verify that it is actually used and available, you can actually use uh, the service principle list command so we can actually see whether our username or service principle is actually created. So right now we have a service principle. Uh, we still need to define a role. We will do that right away uh, because at the end of the day, we just have an, let's call it probably technically incorrectly, an account. Uh, we still have to assign a role so that it can actually make modifications for the network in AKS. Another thing we need to set up AKS uh, is an SSH private key. Uh, if you want to log in into um, your Azure Kubernetes nodes. Uh, to do this, this is pretty simple. We can actually generate an SSH key with no password, of course. Um, and then we can actually put that file also inside of a helper variable. I'm just putting these files inside of the helper variable so I don't have to type it every time. Now, to continue uh, our installation of AKS, what we need to do is create a resource group, um, define a location. So the location in our case would be Western Europe. If you look into the example of my colleague Ivan, he's using, I think, Central US. So depending on the region you are and depending on where you want to install it, uh, check out the locations and the availability of the versioning of Kubernetes. So that's the only uh, catch to take care of. So to do that, we'll basically um, also use the idea of helper variables. So I just create a variable saying that uh, my resource group is called Philip Laser 2. Um, as we call this laser sessions. My location will be Western Europe. The account I just created is called uh, Philip Laser 2. And last but not least, I need to actually specify a role uh, for my service account. So I still need to do the mapping. I still need to map the role contributed to the service principle. And I'm going to choose a very cool name for my cluster. So nothing fancy happened. I just created environment variables. I will use in the subsequent commands uh, to create everything I need, okay? So the only thing you have to make sure if everything is set up is that you define a location and that you define actually a cluster name. All the rest 
is actually something you always have to do in Azure. So, <coughs> sorry. Uh, to go on, we're going to create, first of all, a resource group. A resource group in Azure is actually that's, yeah, a group yeah, in which we're going to map all our resources that we create because we need to create vnets, we need to create load balances, we need to create an AKS cluster and so on and so forth. So this is all grouped together. Um, and to continue doing that, um, we need a reference to that resource group. So this command will populate a variable that actually identifies the ID of the region ID I just created. Um, if you actually run this command, you can actually see uh, the ID. So I need that. I also need to have uh, my client ID. So I also need an ID which is referencing uh, the service principle I created. So this is the way to get that. Um, of course, you can actually simply do stuff like this and copy paste it if, if you want. Okay. So that's not the biggest problem. So you can actually copy paste the links straight out of it. But in this case, uh, it's easier uh, if you want to automate things. Next step is I have the resource group in which I want to deploy. I need, I know which service principle I'm going to give all the access to make the modifications. So right now I actually have to a kind of role binding. Um, so what I will do right now is actually say, okay, I assign the role contributor to uh, this client. So the service principle in the resource group. Uh, it's a lot of uh, weird JSON and YAML, but at the end of the day, this is how you assign roles to a service principle so that it can actually actually update um, the uh, AKS environment uh, later on. If you're wondering which versions are available, um, there are a bunch of commands. Let's see if, for example, um, you see, um, version 17 and so on and so forth uh, are still in preview. That's the reason why we actually asked to use AKS preview when we configured uh, the AZ uh, CLI, otherwise it would not allow it. And you can also uh, see which versions currently are available. Um, this might change between regions. Um, so run the command so that you can see which versions in which location has been um, available. So we installed the Azure CLI, we created the service principle and we actually mapped it to a role into a resource group um, and we created the resource group. Uh, last thing, most important thing is that we're going to install an AKS cluster or create an AKS cluster. And to do this, as I mentioned, there are two ways of doing this. Uh, one is using the AZ AKS create command. Um, another way to do it is through the use of uh, resource management templates. Um, now, I will run the command. Um, as I said, I have some resource issues. Maybe it will not create it, but um, I used it on the, on the other CLI, so it's created already. So to do this, it's pretty straightforward. Um, when you do this, you actually do create, you actually say in which resource group, a cluster name. So that's something we already defined. Uh, you can specify the versions of Kubernetes to use. You can actually see which service site is to use, document page addresses and so on and so forth. So Nothing really, you see that we pass the service principle 
to Kubernetes, I guess, so that can actually use that service principle to configure uh, the load balancer. And by this, we also upload an SSH key so that we can use that key to log in to our uh, nodes if we want to. So if we hit enter, um, normally, um, as I said, it will uh, give uh, an error message, but you actually see um, that it will create it, um, but I already created too much um, machines to prepare this. So, but if you issue this command, um, you actually come into the scenario here. So it takes about five to 10 minutes. So don't get too um, impatient. So it takes about five to 10 minutes, I think, uh, before it is actually fully created. It has to create a lot of resources inside of uh, AKS. And once it is done, you can actually see um, what AKS clusters are available um, inside of, um, but like always, it takes a while, but it will show you actually uh, that this AKS cluster is available and that you can actually use it. Now, through using the AZ AKS commands, we can actually um, manage our AKS clusters, update, create resources, and so on and so forth. Um, takes longer than I expect. Um, so, um, so once we have that AKS cluster, um, the way we need to connect to our uh, Kubernetes environment is another different game. So uh, to actually use and get our uh, Kubernetes config file, we can actually issue a similar command, which is basically get credentials for the resource group or cluster name, makes sense. And we're going to create a cube config file that's what we typically use to connect to our Kubernetes clusters. Um, or you put it in .cube uh, directory, or you actually export the cube config file through means of a variable. So at this point, we should be able to see our Kubernetes nodes. We should see whether or not we have pods created uh, and so on and so forth. As you can see these are demo files we actually created, okay? Um, the other way that you can install AKS clusters is through means, as I mentioned, to ARM templates. So, the ARM template is actually a template file um, similar to Terraform, if you uh, remember Terraform. It's not the same, but uh, it looks towards the same idea. The main difference here is that you have to template, of course, the configuration. You also have way more uh, configuration settings that you don't have in the UI in the web UI or through AKS create. Um, but it essentially starts out with the same um, idea. I need a service principle and I need a resource group. So the steps are similar, but the cool thing is that deploying the cluster is actually one simple repeatable command. Um, we created these files for you. So there are in the repo I shared under here. Um, if you look at the AKS VMS JSON file here, it actually says and shows a lot of things concerning your AKS cluster. So you can actually use that. But if we take a look at it, you'll probably see that it's using the default side values, if not overridden. Yeah, simply as that. So it takes default values, but you can actually overwrite every value uh, that you want. 
this is a template to create um, machines. If you look at in the parameter the JSON file, and this is the only file you actually have to change. So if you want to try this out, you can go to the AKS parameter JSON file. And as you can see, there are all the values that are actually referenced in the VMS file. So the only thing I did was added the correct version. I put it to 16.13. I copied my key in it, yeah? And I populated service principle secret and client. So these things are created. So let me see if I can show this. Um, so this is um, the deployment I created here. So as you can see, there is AKS parameters. So if we would basically do AKS parameters. You can actually see that I populated the client ID. I created a password essentially and my cluster name. Yeah. And if you want to stipulate or add some more uh, features, you can. Um, uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, so the only thing you have to do right now is type AZ deployment. And if you want to get rid of it, you can actually simply uh, delete that uh, cluster. If you want to build it back up, you just run the command. But again, this will take 10 to 15 minutes to do. Um, and since I'm out of resources in um, Azure, uh, it will give you exactly the same message. Now, I already done this. I already deployed that. Um, let me close this. I already deployed this cluster. Um, so if everything works out, I should see the notes. Uh, so these are uh, the ARM deployed ones. I also installed uh, Calico Enterprise Edition on it. Um, so if I would show you minus A, you would actually see that it actually installed Tagira or Calico Enterprise as we refer to it on top of my AKS cluster. And that's what you're actually seeing right here. So once you have Calico Enterprise Edition installed, you have this uh, user interface. It will give you an idea about which policies, uh, endpoints you have in your cluster. So you see all the pods, labels, and so on and so forth. Cool things, of course, that you can also visualize the policies um, that are applied to uh, your pods. So for example, we have a pod here. Um, a demo policy. So you can actually see that we created a rule that says that this pot in namespace demo with this label yeah, uh, is allowed to connect on port 80. If you prefer the YAML versions, well, you can actually, using the UI, you can download what is uh, the YAML version of it. So you can actually see, let me see. Where is it? Yeah. For one reason or the other, it doesn't work. But um, yeah. I can show it this. For example, if you would do uh, this, is how it looks. So you can actually. Uh, copy paste honestly the clinical rules into YAML and apply them on the CLI if you would prefer to do that. Cool things about this version is also that we have tiers, so you can have multiple tiers which are controlled with R back and so on and so forth. And to conclude this, um, as I mentioned, it might be very difficult to see who's communicating with who. Well, one of the cool things we added is flow visualization. So it allows you to uh, go and check which flows 
are actually flowing into that AKS cluster. Um, and through means of these colors, which are a lot of colors right now, you can actually go and filter, for example, into the demo, uh, no, sorry, in the demo namespace. So you can actually see who is communicating to who, and you can actually select a flow. You can actually see which rules are applied, and so on and so forth. All this traffic is also locked inside of uh, this version. So if you click on uh, Kibana, um, which I already did because it takes a while to load, you can also actually go and investigate all the flows and you can actually see in a very, very deep detail uh, who is communicating to who, from which namespace to which namespace, which policies are involved, which policies are blocking, which policies are allowing and so on and so forth. So um, this is what Calico Enterprise adds on top of it. Um, but most of the features, so let's say the features from network policies and so on and so forth, um, are also available in open source except some uh, advanced features. This more or less concludes my uh, presentation. I see there is some communication on the chats. I don't know if there is any. One second, somebody is. Um, what questions are? The recordings will be shared. Uh, no worries, they are already on the Tagira channel. Um, a question related to previous clinical session on egress enablement. With that option, can I do a Wi Fi wall altogether to cloud? Yes, um, I, if I understand the question correctly, um, you can integrate um, Calico network policies inside of an external firewall. Um, of course, there needs to be an integration, but there is an integration that, for example, a Calico policy not a policy, but uh, Calico uh, resources like IP addresses, node IP addresses, pod IP addresses are populated automatically inside of external firewalls. But it's address group uh, that are populated, not policies. So um, I don't see any more questions. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, feel free to reach out. You have our email address or Twitter feel free also to join the Slack channel of uh, Tagira, um, where you can always uh, get your questions answered related to um, the open source edition of um, Calico. Thank you, hope to see you soon. Uh, have a great day. I... Ah, sorry. I see there is a question on eBPF, uh, although I don't see the question. Ah. What is the difference between eBPF and Wireshark? Um, Wireshark is basically a sniff. Um, it basically tries to capture um, at networking layer. Um, Wireshark basically used, if I'm not mistaken, BPF, um, which is technically TCP dump. EBPF is some new technology, and it actually allows you to monitor and check out things almost everywhere uh, inside of the kernel. So you can actually see what is going in and out, even on a file type, or which commands are executed on a bash shell. So it's actually a way to program programmatically configure actions and events inside of the kernel. Um, Calico can use eBPF. Uh, eBPF data plane is um, in preview mode. So if you check out the Calico project website, there is a way to, um, to actually um, install it. Okay, but if you, eBPF is pretty new, but it's pretty cool techno, I fully agree. <laughs>
Okay, guys, I thank you. We're think already at the top of the hour. Um, if there are any more questions, please uh, reach out and we'll try to answer them as quickly as possible. Thank you.